2 Corinthians. Old Barabbas. Isn't that amazing? That was his cross he was supposed to die on. And uh, he went free. And uh, Jesus died for him. Died in his place. Just like he did for you and me. All right, 2 Corinthians. And uh, we're going to start with uh, chapter 1. And um, I have no intention of trying to finish this book of Corinthians, nor do I have time, since I only have about four more or five more weeks left. I'm almost down to counting the hours now. But uh, I'm still getting paid a little bit, so I ought to do something, I guess. So, uh, First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, <clears throat> chapter um, one. We'll read a few verses and have a word of prayer, and then we'll say some things about this portion. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia, that is uh, in Greece. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our uh, tribulation that we might be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded uh, by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and so on. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for allowing us to have this place to meet tonight. We thank you for the Bible. I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help us to uh, study it more and read it and hide it in our hearts and obey it. I pray you'll bless these folks here this evening. Thank you for your mercy. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, in this passage, as you can see at the very beginning, uh, Paul is uh, uh, talking about the sufferings that he and uh, his fellow uh, uh, disciples were uh, suffering for the cause of Christ. Uh, verse 8, For we would not have you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we would not or should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And then he goes on to talk about how that they helped with their prayers and uh, their concern uh, for, uh, for, for them, for him. And uh, so in this uh, early part, passage, he talks about how that God had comforted uh, him and uh, the other apostles, and uh, how that could be used for the glory of God. I don't know if you've ever noticed that sometimes there are people who, who are far worse off than we are, but, uh, you know, and we try to comfort them, and before it's over with, we find out that they've been a comfort to us. Dr. DeHaan uh, has written a book, and I believe it's called Broken Things. I'm not sure that's the title, but I believe that's the name of the book. I read it many, many years ago. 
I mean many years ago. But uh, Dr. Dehan was a medical doctor. And later on he became a preacher and was on the radio for many, many years. How many of you ever heard Dr. Dehan? He had a very weird voice, gravelly. Someone said to Dr. Dehan, what made you so, so uh, popular? He said, it was my voice. And that's just about the way he sounded. But uh, uh, in that book, he talked about how, how many times he had gone to the bedside of a suffering saint in an attempt to comfort them, and he said before it was over with, I went away and I, was the, I went away blessed. And how true that is many times. Uh, uh, it seems that there are people that we hope we can be a comfort to and an encouragement to, and before it turns out, uh, things have turned and uh, they become a comfort to us. On the other hand, there are people who are devastated by everything that happens to them. There are just some people that, uh, you know, the, the least tragedy, or maybe it's a great tragedy. In their life, it's probably great, but it seems to destroy them. And uh, they, uh, they have no peace. And they have no uh, comfort or consolation, as Paul talks about in this passage. And uh, they certainly are not in a position to help others. Uh, if you never get any comfort, you certainly will never be able to comfort anybody else. And, uh, and there are people like that. And uh, the difference, I think, is found in our passage here is, uh, you know, that Paul uh, talked about the strength that he had received from Christ. Uh, in verse 3, he calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And, uh, of course, all the blessings that you and I have and everything that comes to us comes through Christ. All of God's mercies, all of God's blessings, our salvation, and everything comes to us through Christ. Uh, he is God's mediator. And He not only mediates in our prayers, but He mediates in our salvation. Uh, he was the one that, uh, that salvation came to us through Him. And our prayers are through Him. And all of God's blessings, uh, the righteousness is imputed to us through Him. So everything that, uh, that we have and all the promises of God that, that are ours come through Christ. And uh, so uh, uh, he, is the, uh, he is the source of our true comfort. And uh, I know people, I watch people, you know, many times people who are hurting will come to church or they'll come to the office. And uh, they're looking for relief, they're looking for uh, comfort from the stress or the problem that they have. But many times they are not interested in the Lord as the one who does that. They're not interested. They just want, uh, they just want to, uh, to get out from under their burden. And uh, so people have different ways, different approaches to how they try to get rid of their problems and deal with their burdens. Uh, some people think their problems are, are no worse than anybody, anybody else's. But uh, you know, um, if it's your problem, it's, it's yours. That's the only difference. Um, the, my problem is mine. It's not yours. And, uh, and so uh, some people think that, uh, that uh, their problems are no worse than those of others. Uh, some people think every, they're positive. Everything will be okay. You know, everything is going to improve. So they take a positive mental attitude. Sometimes you tell the truth about how you feel, it kind of disarms people. It, it throws them off balance because we just expect people to say everything's okay. You know, somebody called me the other day and said, how are you doing, Brother Blue? I said, no, I'm a little shy of perfect. And, um, but, um, you know, there's just this mindset that uh, we're supposed to answer things a, a special way to Christian people. And, uh, and so, you know, they, we, we try to, you know, I watched it with Christopher Reed. Remember him? He was Superman. He's the fellow that 
broke his neck in a, in a riding a, he was riding a horse and was and he fell off of it and broke his neck and I remember when they would interview him how he was going to whip that uh, you know through his positive mental attitude well he's dead now you see and uh, I, you'll see him take celebrities and, and important people and and uh, who have cancer and uh, you know and the and and the news commentator and others you know they'll try to to build up on this positive mental attitude and uh, there are a lot of things in life that a positive mental attitude can't fix you know and uh, certainly it uh, if you've got death in your body uh, you need medical help or uh, or maybe nothing's going to help you except somebody just comforting you and uh, so people, you know, they think things are going to improve. Uh, some people believe they can't be helped. You know, they just give up. Uh, they can't be helped. But, uh, you know, your, uh, your, your condition may not be helped, but your disposition sure can. And uh, so many people try to seek, you know, uh, they try to seek comfort and find it in all the wrong places. I think there's a Western song out there, looking for love in all the wrong places. I can tell all you Western fans have heard it. Um, some people try to forget. They think, you know, just if I can just get it out of my mind, and you know, then then I'll be all right. And and uh, but it's the wrong place to look for comfort. And uh, tr really, real comfort comes from God. If you look down in verse, uh, verse 3, He is called the God of all comfort. And that is an interesting title for God. It would be interesting just to preach on that, that uh, definition of God Himself. He is the God of all comfort. And uh, He was that kind of God in the Old Testament. You don't have a different God. didn't change from the Old to the New Testament. He didn't change his disposition. He didn't change his nature, his attributes. He's always been the God of all comfort. And uh, when you think about it, uh, his very first act was to clothe and comfort Adam and Eve. Uh, they were naked. They had disobeyed God. And uh, he said, in the day you eat thereof you'll die. But God uh, comforted them and loved them and provided everything for them. Now they did die because they, they disobeyed God. But from the very beginning, God is a God of comfort. Uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord because he knew the Lord. And uh, so Paul calls him the God of all comfort. Uh, the reason He's the God of all comfort is, if you look a little bit further there, He is the Father of mercies. He's the Father of mercies. That's in verse 3. And uh, the word Father in this context implies source. Uh, he is the source of all mercies. Let me tell you what happened today. It just, just came to my mind. I went down to a, a doctor today and uh, came down the elevator in my wheelchair and came to the door and there was just a, there was a, just a little square uh, handicap thing that you hit there and the door opens for you. And I hit the door, hit that deal, the door opened and I went out. And I thought the verse that came to my mind is every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And you know that's a good thing right there. Now listen, if you don't, uh, if you don't have any problems then you can't appreciate uh, the little things that God does for you. But uh, I thought about that. What a comfort that is for uh, folks who are handicapped and have uh, disabilities to be able to hit a little pad and a door opens. Wouldn't it be good if churches did that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Or they had elevators so they could get upstairs or something, you know, when they get old. But um, I thought about that verse and I thought about my attitude as a young man uh, toward, uh, toward such things. 
you know. I mean, I didn't have a positive attitude about all these old people taking up the handicapped parking spots, <laughs> you know, um, and a lot of other, other things. But, but once you get to the place to where, no matter what it is, uh, you know, the Bible said to, a, to the hungry soul, every morsel is sweet. You know, when you're starving, you're not too particular. You won't be griping about the food if you're starving. But if you're full all the time, you can't appreciate anything. And I think there's a lot of truth in that in our lives. Uh, the, 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 the mercies and the comfort of God can't mean much to you unless you need comfort and mercy. And, uh, and so in our text here, God is called the, the, the Father. So really, God is the source of all mercies, every merciful thing. And it's only by God's mercy and His goodness that you and I are not consumed, according to the Bible. And uh, so he's the source of all kinds of goodness and mercy. And uh, when you begin to think about it, uh, the fact that you can breathe air in your lungs, and the fact you can drink a drink of water, and uh, the fact that you have all the conveniences that you do, and, um, and, and all of the good things that you have, are gifts from God, and it's not because you're any better than anybody else. I don't know why God does it unless it's so we can confer it on somebody else. Just as Jesus is the mediator through whom God gives all these things, uh, you and I are to become the dispensers of God's mercies and of God's comfort. So you say, well, I don't know why God gives us, I mean, in America, why are we so blessed? Well, it's certainly not because we're anybody, but it may be because God wants to use you as a steward to dispense the good things that God gives you. And I believe that. I believe it. I don't think that God ever intended for us to... to uh, hoard things for ourselves. That is wicked. And uh, so comfort is just one of, the, one of the mercies that our Lord gives us. And uh, there in verse 3, He's called the God of all comfort. In, uh, in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, He's called the God of all comfort and patience. And, uh, and so uh, God is patient with you and me. He's long-suffering, and um, He waits on us. He waits on us. He waits on you to grow up. He waits on you to learn. He waits on you to, uh, to make a change. And, um, and so He waits on you. He gives you time. We're very impatient people, but God is not, God is not, uh, not at all impatient uh, with His people. Uh, the Bible says one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Now, if you look at verse uh, 4, uh, he usually he gives us this comfort when it is most needed, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Now listen to me carefully. If you aren't having any tribulation, you don't need any comfort. A fellow one time said uh, to Mr. Spurgeon, uh, I know that the grace of God is available, but I just don't think I have dying grace. And Spurgeon said, are you dying? And the fellow said, no. He said, then you don't need it. You know, we got a lot of people praying for the power of God, but they're praying for it for display. Uh, the power of God may come in a way that you, you might not imagine. You know, we think it's the top blowing off, but it may be the bottom of our self-sufficiency falling out. 
And uh, so in verse 4 it says, Who comforteth us in all of our tribulation. And uh, that's why Paul could rejoice in tribulation. Paul got to the place spiritually to where he said, I take pleasure in opposition. I take pleasure in those things. Now why? Because he knew the grace of God that would come to him. And uh, you know that's what you can do. You can uh, when when you have some kind of a of a of a any kind of an, an issue, tribulation or sickness or uh, somebody giving you a fit. Um, the best thing to do is wait on God. And uh, and if you know if you uh, if you get ornery, God can't bless you anymore. So you need to stay right with God in these matters, no matter what they are. And uh, the Lord said, "Vengeance is mine; I will repay." And so we need to leave, you know, make sure we leave that up to Him. But when we're in some kind of opposition, or we're in some kind of a, um, a tragedy or illness, uh, then is when we are able to experience the comfort of God. And uh, you know, you know, I probably sounds foolish to some of you, but you know, over the, uh, the months, over the months, the least little thing uh, that that is comforting or that is uh, makes my life easier, or uh, somebody tries to do for me, is magnified a hundredfold. You understand? I couldn't understand it before. I wasn't in a position to appreciate it, nor was I in a position to need it. But you have to have, you have to have um, tribulation in your life if you are going to have God's comfort in your life. And, uh, and if you're going to be able to uh, uh, to uh, to appreciate it. In verse 5 it says, For as the sufferings of Christ abounded in us. Now Paul is talking about the suffering that he and his fellow believers were going through as they tried to get the gospel out. And he said the suffering of Christ abounded in us. And uh, everywhere we went it was prison or it was stoning or it was whipping or it was people, uh, you know, um, uh, mistreating him for the cause of Christ. Look at verse 8 again. For, brother, we would not have you ignorant of our trouble that came upon us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. We were pressed above strength. In other words, he said we really had given up all hope we were going to live. We had really had the sentence of death in our lives. In other words, we'd came, we came to the place to where there was absolutely no hope and nowhere to look. I don't think anybody in this room has been in that position yet. Maybe you have. But um, he said that uh, we despaired even of life. And so don't, uh, don't resist don't fight against um, the tribulation. Don't fight against the things that God would bring into your life because God wants to do more for you. And uh, He wants to show you some things. And you certainly cannot see them if you're not standing in the right place. And so uh, he says these comforts of God are bestowed in all of our tribulation. It comes when it's most needed. And that is seen, uh, seen throughout the Bible. The Lord has said in Hebrews, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said, I'll never leave you. And you take that by faith. He said, I'll never leave you. So, you know, if you're in a hospital bed somewhere with cancer, the Lord's promise is still good. He said, I'll never leave you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. 
And I believe that. I believe that. And you know what that is when you believe it? It's a comfort. Sometimes the best comfort is not talking to people. Sometimes the best comfort is just being silent. Folks who are trained in the area of working with suffering people in the hospital and different places, they will tell you that many times just your presence sitting in the room, you're just sitting there in the room, is all the comfort an individual needs. You don't need to have to, you don't have to carry on a conversation with them. And they may not feel like talking, but they don't want you to leave. They just, your very presence of being there is a comfort to them. I remember as a, as a boy, this is going to sound kind of weird, but it wasn't weird. <laughs> but when I was a little boy, before my mother, my mother married my stepdad, I slept with my mother. Now that's not an uncommon thing down south. Cousins and everybody sleep together. So, but uh, but I was just a, I was a little kid. But I you know I wasn't a baby. I wasn't an infant. But I remember this. And I remember one night I was laying in bed, and uh, it was dark. And uh, I said, uh, I reached my hand over my mother's face to feel her face. And I said, uh, I asked her, I said, Mom, have you got your eyes open? She said, yes. And I don't remember what else I said. But I know now why I said that. I was just a little boy in the dark. And if my mother had her eyes open, even in the dark, I felt secure. Does that make sense to you? Well, we need to get that sense in the time of trouble of the presence of Jesus Christ. His eyes are always open. He that keepeth Israel will never sleep or slumber. The night is as the light unto him. And But that presence would give you comfort. Lord, I know you're here, and I know you got your eyes open, and you see everything that's going on. And, uh, you know, that's, that is a great comfort to know that, that, he'll never, that He never leaves you. You know, here's another thing that the Lord promised is that He said, I won't allow you to be tempted above that you are able to bear it, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. So the Lord never sends you or me anything that He doesn't provide the grace for us to get through it. And I don't, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what it is, God's grace is sufficient in all testings, in all trials, and in all tribulations. God is never going to send you something that He cannot help you get through. Now you may think at the time, you know, you have a little child that gets killed or something. I mean, I don't know of anything that could... I don't, I don't know what could be worse than having a little four- or five-year-old child. You know, I, I know dads that have backed out of the driveway and their kids were playing and they backed over them and killed them. I don't know of anything that would be more tragic than that. I don't know how anything could be more tragic than walking out to the swimming pool and seeing your little four-year-old laying at the bottom of the pool. But I know people that's happened to. I don't know what could be more tragic than a little six-year-old boy getting his daddy's pistol and running from his sister who was trying to take it away from him and he jumped on the bed and the gun went off and shot him in the chest and killed him instantly. I don't know what could be more tragic to a parent than that. I don't know what it would be because that child is your life. It's like your heart being pulled out. My mother had many of those to happen to her. I don't know what could be more tragic than that. Maybe something could. Job lost all of his in one day. <laughs> they were all at a birthday party in the house, and the wind came along, blew the house down, and all of his kids killed every one of them instantly. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? After all he was going through, 
and then somebody coming to you and saying, your kids are all dead. I don't know anything more tragic than that. But you know what? God gave Job the grace to get through it. Job was able to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. You think you've reached that point yet? You think you could say that? Why, most of us can't even say that when the air conditioner goes out on our, in our car or something. I mean, that's the biggest tragedy we have. But I'm gonna, I want to tell you something, and I'm telling you this. You just want to stay alert because one of these days in your life, God is going to bring the big one. He's going to bring the big one. And uh, with it comes the grace to get through it. Doesn't mean it won't bring you to your knees. That's probably what ought to happen, don't you think? I mean, if it knocked you to your knees, that might be the best thing that could happen. You're going to feel like your heart's been torn out. You will want to die. You'll cry like David, oh, would to God it was me instead of him. That's what any parent would say. But it wasn't David, it was his boy, Absalom. So God says that there is no temptation or trouble or trial that has taken you, but such is common to men. Everything that's happening to people in this room is happening to the folks in the next church and the next church and the next church. They're all the same. We're all the same. And uh, so uh, thank God that, you know, He bestows His grace and uh, He gives us the ability to bear it. That's what I pray for, for my wife and for myself. You know, that when I get to the place where I can't even turn over in bed, and I'm about halfway there now, but I can't even turn over in bed. I can't lift my legs or lift my arms. That I will take advantage of the grace of God and that my wife will also be comforted with God's presence and grace. You understand? He is the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation. But we need to avail ourselves of it. We can fall apart and become bitter and have self-pity and blame God or blame somebody else or that nothing is good enough and nobody's treating you right or you can be thankful for every mercy and every act of kindness. I, um, just about everywhere I go now, people open doors for me. If I'd have known that, I'd have got this wheelchair 20 years ago. <laughs> but about wherever where I go, if somebody's about to go in the door ahead of me, they'll say, I'll get it for you. You know, I just say thank you. That's one of God's mercies. It is. It's one of God's mercies. And I don't even know the name of the individual or the man or the woman, nor do I need to. But I need to acknowledge that it is God's mercy. You see, I dropped my keys out here this afternoon. I struggled for about 15 minutes to, <laughs> to get those keys up off the sidewalk out here, you know. And so, you know, you, you thank God for every little act of kindness because they come from God. If a drink of water comes from God, if a breeze comes from God, which it does, you know, a good night's sleep comes from God. Paul was comforted by the coming of Titus. 
I mean, if a fellow believer just shows up to fellowship with you, that's one of God's comforts that He's sending to you. Paul said, we were com I was comforted by the coming of Titus. He said to the Philippians, I received the gift that you sent. It's an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice unto God. But he acknowledged it as from God and to God. And uh, then the Lord said, Yea, the, the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. For the Christian death is a shadow. It's a shadow. Shadows never stay. They're just temporary. And the thing about death for the Christian is that it's but a shadow. It's not, it's not eternal. It's not lasting. It's like taking a sleep, going to sleep. And David understood that. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley, it's a valley of the shadow of death. It's not death. It's the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. As I said, these are all bestowed through Christ. Why does God so comfort us? Why are we so blessed? Why does God uh, send people just at the right time? The text tells us here in verse 4, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort others. You got that? That is why God comforts you. That's why God blesses you. Not only because He loves you and wants to demonstrate His love to you, but He wants you to take that love and that comfort and that grace and extend it to other people and be a blessing to somebody else, be a comfort to somebody else. That means you have to think about other people. You can't just be thinking about yourself. If you are, you'll never get enough. If all you're doing is thinking about yourself, you won't get enough attention. You won't get enough of anything. But you know, you could get lost in helping other people. A woman said to Jack Hiles one time, she said, I think I'm just about to have a nervous breakdown, whatever that is. <laughs> I've heard of a hoedown. But a breakdown, I guess that's a different kind of dance. But um, she said, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. And Jack Hiles said, well, let me suggest something to you. Do you know how to bake? She said, yes, sir. She said, why don't you make some cookies? And why don't you take those cookies over to the nursing home, and you go from one room to the other and visit with the people in the nursing home and give them some cookies and pray with them and talk with them. And see what God does for you. About a month later, he saw her in the hallway and he said, Oh, by the way, Mrs. Smith, how are you coming on that breakdown? She said, Oh, I haven't had time to think about that. I've been too busy. <laughs> see, she got her mind on helping other people. And that's what you have to do. You have to lose yourself in helping people and you forget about yourself. And uh, that's, you know, and if you forget about yourself, uh, that's one of the ways God comforts you. You get your mind off of it. But He does this so we can comfort others. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he, wants us to, he wants us to help others. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians here in chapter 7. And we'll look at a couple of verses and we'll be through. Verse 6. Chapter 7, verse 6. And um, <clears throat> look at verse, uh, well, 7 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, Corinthians. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Why? 
For when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. That's Paul. Nevertheless, verse 6, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of...